Um, our last speaker is actually two speakers. We'll be hearing from Anne Logan and Brianne Kisselstein, who are PhD candidates within the School of Integrative Plant Science at Cornell University. And they are going to share their insights on navigating inaccessible research ecosystems. Thank you so much, Anne and Brianne. So today, my dear friend, and Anne and I will be talking about the essential role of support networks in navigating an inaccessible ecosystem. So to start, I'll introduce myself. Hi, I'm Brianna. I'm currently graduating with my PhD in plant pathology at Cornell, where I've just I've been studying grapevine diseases and I just passed my defense a couple of weeks ago. And I identify as deaf, blind, chronically ill, neurodivergent, and queer. And anyone who knows me knows that I'm a fierce advocate for equity and accessibility for marginalized folks from all backgrounds, but especially those with disabilities. Hello, I'm Anne. And I will soon be finished with my PhD in horticulture sciences with a focus in viticulture at Cornell. I'm also a tutor at Gallaudet University, and I mentor several students in their postgraduate careers center. I'm also a wine educator and viticulturist. We will be talking about why support networks are important. But first, we have a little bit of background information. Have you heard of the deaf tax? Some of you have, some of you maybe not. So go ahead and take a guess. Option A, it's a tax that all disabled, deaf and hard of hearing people must pay. Yay, in addition to federal and state taxes. Option B, is a tax that institutions such as colleges and universities must pay as punishment for not abiding by the ADA. Option C, the mental fatigue associated with having to heavily advocate for oneself to be able to access the same information as other people access easily. And option D, Oh, what is that? So what's the answer? C, the mental fatigue associated with advocating. We can't take a break from advocating because we are trailblazers. We are the first deaf people. We had dreams to do this and to get these PhDs and we want to make it easier for other people after us to achieve their dreams. And it's not limited just to deaf and hard of hearing people, but it also applies to all disabled people. I've had professors say to me, oh, you have a learning disability or you need to go to the Students with Disability Services office to get the captioning instead of just providing a transcript a podcast when I asked. Brianne and I have also spent many hours emailing the Disability Services Office, asking, requesting for interpreters. And sometimes we don't even know if an interpreter will show up. We hope so. And we hope that it's a professional interpreter, not one who's unprofessional. Not only does being disabled come with a heavy tax, having multiple marginalized identities means even further discrimination and disadvantages. This is important because disabled people are not only more likely to live in poverty and face additional health inequities, but people from many other marginalized groups are also at higher risk for disability, such as women and trans people and Black and Indigenous people. 
And when people exist at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities, the effects are antagonistic, meaning they don't just add together, they multiply. Just try to imagine being a Black disabled person in 2020 and being expected to focus on your studies when we saw so, so many videos circulating of Black people being killed by police and when we were being told that there was a mask and ventilator shortage and that disabled lives weren't worth saving. For me, I was born with hearing loss, but didn't get hearing aids until I was three years old. So I had a lot of language challenges like so many other deaf children who grow up in hearing families. When I was 14, I was diagnosed with Usher syndrome and told I was going to go blind. All within the couple of years that followed, I had lost so much vision that I became legally blind and I lost a lot of family members to rare diseases. Well, I've never quite fit in. The shock when I started the PhD program just completely overpowered me. I was surrounded by people who had professors as parents and they always knew that a PhD was an option for them. But me, my mom was the first person in the family to go to college and get a bachelor's degree. And I didn't know anyone with a PhD growing up. Have you heard of the hidden curriculum in terms of doctoral education? What do you think it is? The hidden curriculum is a set of unofficial, unwritten, or unspoken rules, expectations, and behaviors that govern academic achievement. Being a victim of the hidden curriculum feels like everyone got a handbook except for you. And it often means not knowing what's expected of you, that you're allowed to have expectations for your advisors, what fellowships to apply for, how to find mentors, and so much more. So let me ask you, how can you excel when you can't even find the curriculum? Mutual support among disabled and marginalized people is, makes a world of difference. It's not a coincidence that Anne and I both struggled with the same challenges despite working in different departments and doing research on completely different campuses. It was when we wrote an article together on why mutual support matters that I realized we both felt so much shame for being the last student in our cohorts to pass the candidacy exam. And instead of feeling like an individual failure, Mutual support helps you realize that the system is working against you. Mutual support allows you to advocate as a team because advocating for yourself alone can not only make you feel like a burden compared to your counterparts, it's also easier for others to ignore. But when you have mutual support, you might just be like me and, and one other deaf student and you might just start a group chat and realize you're all having the same exact problem and call a joint meeting with disability services and require to them to raise the standards for professionalism and the ASL interpreters that they hire. So mutual support is not the only tool that we use to help us make change. We also use support networks, and that is a valuable tool to have. And so I really wanna thank my family and friends for all of their support through this. I was born deaf, and I use both spoken English and sign language to communicate. To get me to where I am now, I've needed a lot of support networks. And so I have some tips and suggestions on how to create support networks and what they look like. First of all, you need someone to encourage you, to believe in you, to help you, to tutor you in all areas. Often deaf students have gaps in their education that are not their fault, but many in academia or universities or colleges don't understand or don't realize 
We also have other supports like animals or viticulture. Or there are many different options. And so we're going to wrap up with some resources. And I hope that you can see all of these be put to use in topic B. Thank you for coming. One additional comment is I think that the discussion board is open. So if you have questions for us, you can start to type them in now. Thank you.